Hi, I'm Karina Schuster, and I'm very excited to be hosting the brand new SciTech Swiss Re podcast. Listen to us and learn something new today. For nearly 20 years, as a witness for the BBC to the greatest challenge of our time. How we're damaging the planet so profoundly that we're turning the climate against us. It's a job that's taken me to the farthest corners of the world. I felt despair as extreme weather strikes people least able to resist it. I've been attacked for highlighting the risks of global warming. And I've also experienced hope that clever ideas and a rising generation will help us to find a way through. So this is my story, reporting from the climate front line. How are you? I'm very well <laughs> and nice to be doing this. How are you keeping? I'm fine, thank you. I'm actually, you know, following you up from Siri. Where are you right now? I'm in the southwest of France, near Biarritz. Wow, that's great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. That's such a pleasure Not at meeting all. you. <laughs> it's, it's 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 nice to do. It's it's a. I mean, I'm I'm passionate about the subject, so it's any opportunity to talk about it, I'll I'll say yes to. Yeah, so first of all, welcome yeah, yeah. to our podcast, yeah. which is called SciTech Suisse. We are actually covering a lot of stories on, you know, scientific topics and also, you know, technology. As a journalist covering, you know, a lot of environmental issues, how can technology help address and mitigate the impacts of climate change globally? Technology is absolutely crucial. I mean, we all want there to be a magic silver bullet of some clever invention where the whole problem of climate change just goes away. And the world sadly doesn't work like that. What you need are clever inventions in many, many different sectors and many different fields, clever inventions that we can use in our everyday lives or inventions that industries can use or aviation, shipping and so forth. But that they need to be supported and introduced and people have to be convinced that they're worth pursuing. So, for example, the technologies of photovoltaic panels have been around for a very long time. I mean, NASA sent them to the moon in the 1970s, but they cost millions of dollars. So it, it took something which was beyond the technology. It was an innovation. It was a production process that reduced costs. It was a sharing of knowledge. It was a greater availability of an encouragement by governments that have made photovoltaic panels as popular as they are today. You don't just get from the lab to a rooftop that in a way that's affordable without a series of things coming together. Yes, you need the tech. But yes, you've got to have the innovative process that makes that tech affordable and deployable. And I've seen that for myself with the example of offshore wind. 20 years ago, the idea of planting wind turbines in the ocean was ridiculed. I had experts tell me these things will blow over. How are they going to get the power back to the land? It's always going to be too expensive. And I filmed Britain's first offshore wind turbines, and they looked pretty miserable and pointless, and this would never take off. But 10 years later, I was climbing out in the Irish Sea, a 100-meter-high tower, which was the tower for what was then the world's largest wind turbine, five megawatts. And the experts then said, well... Okay, it does work. They don't get blown over in a storm, <laughs> but it's still very expensive. Now you look at offshore wind and Britain has benefited. British households are benefiting from the sheer amount of offshore wind power that's in the national grid because it's so much cheaper than burning gas to generate electricity. So in 20 years, 
You go from a great idea that has a lot of problems to an idea whose time has come. And it's a technology, it starts with tech, obviously, um, but a tech that really benefits society and means that we can buy less gas from Putin, for example. And I think when you see that kind of story, it, it really reinforces how important it is that you encourage the scientists to come up with the fundamentals. You foster the technologists and the engineers to create the products. You make sure that your policymakers and your politicians create environments for investment that, that make this kind of tech viable. You share the knowledge with companies and with consumers and the public. And you end up with a situation where everybody benefits. Definitely, that's definitely the message. And how do you think the governments are responding to this kind of technology approach? Some are being very adventurous and proactive and are really trying to make a big difference. I mean, the wonderful example of Norway and electric vehicles. The, uh, yeah, definitely. They just, they just made it in everyone's interest to get an electric car. Um, another example would be Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, the huge investments being made now in all forms of clean tech that will really incentivize the market because it'll be good business sense for companies to come into that space, benefit from those investments and capitalize and see fantastic market opportunities. Other examples, I mean, China is leading the world in renewables with incentives and um, all kinds of benefits in terms of making planning easier and, and, and so forth. And, and some very inventive schemes. You know, there's a, a wonderful scheme in China where districts are encouraged to invest in rooftop solar. So the local authority, the local politicians, local businesses, providers of solar panels and, and local householders uh, and, and local business people, entrepreneurs, are all encouraged to work together to buy in large quantities panels for them to install on their roofs at a lower cost than you'd get if they bought them individually. And that's the kind of scheme which I find really exciting, where, where a community on quite a big scale is working together. So it obviously starts with national government, but at a local level, a great deal of innovation in tech and tech deployment can be driven have a lot of experience when it comes to reporting, you know, what were some of the most important stories? There was one, I've been to the Arctic, which is one of the fastest exactly. warming regions on the planet. I've been there many times to report on how it's changed. And one of my first trips was in 2004, and I went to the Greenland ice sheet. And although it's called the ice sheet, a sheet so you think of as thin, but actually the Greenland ice sheet is incredibly thick. And if it all melts, it'll raise the global sea level by seven meters. And we don't want even a bit of that to happen, but it's starting. And in 2004, I went with scientists to one corner of the ice sheet and they were really shocked by the speed of the melting. It seemed to me that there was plenty of ice. There were great ice cliffs, there were icebergs, there was ice everywhere. But 15 years later, I went back to exactly the same place, which is, Quite unusual to be able to do that, but 2019, back to the same place. And I was shocked. I mean, there was rock. The, the, if there was any ice left, it was very diminished and dirty and melting fast. Uh, the place looked completely different. And the scientists I was with say, yeah, yeah we've reached a stage where we we don't sleep at night. We're so worried about what's happening and, and what that really brought it home to me because over those 15 years, this massive change. And then that relates to sea level rise. And I was in Vietnam in the Mekong Delta, very beautiful, popular with tourists. It's a great rice producing region. And it, it, it's always historically been flooded. 
but but the rate of flooding has become more frequent and more intense as the sea level rises. And we were filming in a school, and there was a class of nine, ten-year-olds, and the teacher asked them to close their eyes for a minute and just picture flooding. What what did what was in their minds when they thought of flooding? And then to open their eyes and grab their crayons and, and pencils and, and, and draw what they'd been seeing in their minds. And what appeared on those pages was profoundly upsetting to me and the teacher and, and my cameraman, because these were nightmare visions of, of children drowning and of houses being swept away and of of sort of monsters in the flood water, sort of trying to eat people. And and I just thought, we've created a situation where a whole generation in, in that region, and, and probably many others, a whole generation is growing up already traumatized by the effects of climate change. I mean, when I was 10 years old, I didn't worry about getting <laughs> flooded. You know, I worried about all kinds of other things, uh, but nothing existential like that. And so th that really brought it home to me that this this matters on a on a human level. It matters physically. It matters for mental health. I mean, what are these kids going to be like? What are their lives going to be like in, in when they grow up? Um, so that, that I think the witnessing the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet and and seeing what sea level rise is already doing, the harm it's doing to young people, both of those together have really bit made a big impression on me. And have convinced me, obviously, that the science is real and, and, and the situation is critical and, and that it's utterly urgent that we try and do something about it.